Hello, I'm Professor Stephen Abbott, and welcome to this introduction to some of the workbooks in the large spreadsheet that you can download related to nanocoatings, principles and practice. When Nigel Holmes and I created this book, we were determined to have lots of formulae, of course, but we didn't want to leave you with just these dead formulae. So we provided this spreadsheet so that all the formulae can be brought to life. Here's an example. We know that the surface area to volume ratio of nanoparticles is very important, but how does it change when you change the size of a nanoparticle? So we have two different nanoparticles, one with a radius of 100 nanometers, one with a radius of 5 nanometers. The surface area of each of these is calculated by 4 pi r squared, the volume is calculated, and the ratio, surface area over volume, is also calculated, and it's proportional to 1 over the radius. So if I change the radius from 5 nanometers to 10 nanometers, then the ratio changes from 0.05, which was there before, to 0.1. This is a very simple calculation, but getting it right is very useful, and the insights that you can get about the change of surface area and volume can be important. Now let's look at something a little less trivial. You've bought a nanoparticle, and it happens to have a radius of 20 nanometers. But you have to have a stabilizing shell around the nanoparticle. So suppose it had a 2 nanometer shell. What percentage of that nanoparticle is now made up by the nanoparticle itself? Well, it turns out it's 75%, i.e. 25% of your nanoparticle is shell. If you had a 4 nanometer shell, then 58% is nanoparticle. So when you buy nanoparticles, you often get plenty more shell than you expected. When we buy nanoparticles, we want to know what we're buying. So when the manufacturer claims that 95% is smaller than so many nanometers, what does this mean? Well, actually, it can mean very little. Let's create a distribution of nanoparticles. I've got a first curve in dotted blue, and I've got another curve, curve 2, which is this tiny line here where I just have a small amount. Let me just raise it to 10. So we now have a reasonable amount of the larger material, around 180 nanometers. But let me return it to the original 2. That's a very small amount of large material. And if I look at the cumulative number distribution, then of course most of my particles are below, let's say, 50 nanometers. So I've got very few nanoparticles up here. But if I go down to the mass distribution, then I find that I actually have a relatively small amount in terms of mass for small nanoparticles, and I have a rather large amount of mass from those large nanoparticles. So the distribution is very important. If a manufacturer claims number distribution, you might be actually be interested in mass distribution, and they can be very different things. So you can play around with these numbers in the spreadsheet. For scattering, size matters. And here's a Rayleigh scattering calculation. The formula is fairly complicated, but the maths is done for you. We have some small nanoparticles, 30 nanometers, and we have some large nanoparticles at 200 nanometers. Now, most of the particles are small, 90%. But what would happen if the radius of those larger nanoparticles were increased from 200 to, let's say, 210 nanometers? Well, here is the scattering plot depending on angle. If I change this to 210, then the scattering plot changes significantly. So small changes in the amount of large particles can mean significant changes in the scattering you get. And that's borne out realistically by what happens when we have real nanoparticle distributions. There's another aspect to size, and that is shape. And the shape makes a big difference in terms of percolation theory. That means whether you can get a conductive path from one side to the other of a formulation. If you put in 28% of spherical particles, that's aspect ratio of 1, the width over height is 1, 
then you're just below the percolation threshold and you won't get conductivity. If you put in 29% of those particles, you'll get conductivity. You're just above the percolation threshold. Adding 29% of nanoparticles is rather difficult, especially if they're expensive conducting nanoparticles. If the aspect ratio is something like 100, as with carbon nanotubes or silver nanowires, then you only have to add 0.7% to get percolation. And that explains why silver nanowires and carbon nanotubes are so popular as alternatives to indium tinoxide for conductive coatings. I'm just going to show you very briefly a more complicated workbook on DLVO theory. All the formulae for DLVO are contained here. And as with all these workbooks, the inputs are in yellow, so you just have to change the inputs to see what happens to the DLVO output. And the DLVO graph is showing the different terms in DLVO. The H is the Hamaker term. That's the attractive van der Waals term, which brings particles together. There's the Debye term, which is the charge stabilization term. And then the term in green is due to the polymer shell stabilizing by steric effects. And you change the parameters and each of these different effects will change size and you get this total effect here which shows you whether you have a stable or unstable thing. So if I change the Flory Huggins parameter to 0.6 uh, then you get a very large stabilization and these particles will clump. If I change the potential to 20 then the Debye term goes down. If you don't know what the Hamaker constants are, then these are provided in the table. So you have some guidance to what is going on. There are many other workbooks in the spreadsheet. You've seen some of them, surface area and volume shell percent. Here's one on microemulsions. We have something on measuring modulus. We have things on pinholes and fibers, milling, grinding, lots here. It's all free and we hope you'll explore it.